With that, I do uh, want to reconvene the assembly and uh, uh, welcome uh, Mr. Singh uh, to, um, to our assembly. As everyone uh, is likely recalls, he began, I believe he began his career as a criminal uh, defense lawyer and uh, also served in the provincial legislative assembly prior to becoming the uh, federal NDP leader in 2017, I believe I my memory serves correctly. And uh, he is also a, a, a MLA for, or the, a, the MP for uh, Burnaby South um, as well. So welcome, sir, and uh, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, an honor, a tremendous honor to be here to speak with all of you. Greetings to all the chiefs, all the leaders, Grand Chief, to all the staff, to all the organizers. Thank you again for this opportunity. I want, uh, I want to take a moment to, to acknowledge that uh, I am in between communities now on, uh, on a highway between Toronto and Kingston. And so I've just left uh, the traditional territories of the Mississauga and the New Credit. And I'm headed on my way to uh, another nations. But for me, it's important to acknowledge the territories that we're on and just to acknowledge also the injustice that the first people signed with suffered and continue to suffer in my commitment to fight for justice. I want to, I want to also highlight something that I, I a bit of a good news, something that's encouraging to me, and I hope it's encouraging to all of you, Chiefs and Grand Chief. One of the things that we are, we are receiving in terms of feedback in this campaign, in the form of letters, emails, phone calls, messages, more so than we've ever in the past, we're getting people calling and saying that, leaving messages and writing in to say that, the reason we're supporting the New Democrats in this election is because of the work we're doing to fight for Indigenous people. And I think that's encouraging that that is one of the, the biggest messages we're getting. There is a, a wellspring of a desire for justice amongst Canadians that they, they have seen the injustice and, and, are, and are starting to really, there's a conscious shift saying, we've got to do something about the injustice. Which is, which is really powerful. And I just wanted to acknowledge that. I just wanted to also highlight that in this campaign, we've used our platform to highlight the, some of the injustice facing Indigenous communities. And we took the national campaign with us to Kaosis for Stations, as it was a nation uh, among many that had discovered over 700 unmarked graves. And after the first finding in Kamloops, uh, 215 kids that, that there is really this pain that people are feeling around what residential institutions were all about, that they were by design to strip indigenous people of their language, culture, identity, but also to strip them of their lives. And so that was something I wanted to highlight that we have a responsibility to bring every child home in the sense of making sure communities can care for their children, but also every child that an indigenous community wants to discover in other sites, we've got an obligation federally to support bringing those kids back home. So that's something really important in New York to highlight the injustice and the importance of implementing all of the truth and reconciliation calls to action. The second thing we did, we were in Nishkanda a couple of days ago. And for folks that didn't know Nishkanda, I'm sure you already know, it's one of the oldest out our advisories in the, in the country, a community that has not had clean drinking water for over 27 years. So we spoke to the community and they highlighted their stories and were really adamant that they wanted the media to tell their stories, the stories of, of resilience, but the stories also of pain, of, of suicide, of uh, not having clean drinking water in the impacts, and the struggles with housing. So that was really important for us to, to fight for Indigenous people by by sharing the stories, by lifting them. And I just want to know that you can count on us to fight with everything we have for reconciliation, truth, peace, declaration, real spirit of partnership, allyship, and nation to nation relationships. We're also pushing for the Canadian government to stop the legal battles against Indigenous kids. They continue to fight Indigenous kids in court. Despite the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal and the found that kids were willfully and recklessly discriminated against. So that remains a really strong position of ours. 
we uh, want to see investments in housing and the indigenous community for indigenous buy and indigenous housing strategy. We want to see Shannon's dream implemented equitable funding for indigenous people. Uh, we want to see, in addition, not just the calls to action of the TRC, but also the calls to justice for the missing women, indigenous women and girls. Report. We want all those calls for justice also implemented. Uh, this is really important. I just also, in, in wrapping up, want to highlight how Mr. Trudeau called the selfish election. No reason for only two years left in our mandate, calling it in the midst of a fourth wave was the wrong thing to do. But it also meant that we couldn't continue the work we needed to do in Ottawa to continue to fight for indigenous people, fight for language rights. And in some ways, this is really important. Uh, the final thing, I just I, I wanted to highlight how Justin Trudeau's promises ended up costing us. There was a lot of nice things that he said. He's said a lot of words, but it sounds like it's all been to show because he has failed to deliver on things that could have been delivered. And and people end up paying the price. When Mr. Trudeau doesn't bring in clean drinking water, the just community still struggle with a lack of a basic human right. And people are paying, there is a price to be paid from that in actually. Uh, I just want to also just broadly talk about some, a couple of our, our, our priorities. We know that people have gone through a tough time and then we can need that support. So our, our plan is to invest more in the support that people need. So that's uh, healthcare, uh, that's investing in making sure people get the medication cover and that people get the support and help they need. And, and I also want to highlight while we want to invest in housing, invest in indigenous communities, invest in the healthcare system. The big question people are asking who's going to pay for it, we're the only party with a plan to make sure the billionaires pay their fair share. The burden should fall on the super issue, it shouldn't fall on working, the working class, the middle class, it shouldn't fall on people, it should fall on those that haven't been paying their fair share, those who use offshore tax havens, loopholes, and you know, the billionaires and the multi-millionaires, they should be the ones paying their fair share. That's really important to us. And, and I guess finally, uh, I want to again reiterate that if uh, we want to see clean drinking water, indigenous housing, if we want to see healthcare investing, in, if we want to see a real approach to fighting the climate crisis, New Democrats are the best choice to make that happen. So um, I can tell you in the last uh, comment that with the New Democratic government, we would work as allies in the partnership, nation to nation relationships with First Nations, respecting treaty rights. We work together to deliver on the key justice platforms that we've outlined. And you can count on us to be there for you as we have to them and so much more you can count on us. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, Chair. Thank you so much for your presence and thank you again to all the Chiefs, to Grand Chief. Thanks for the opportunity and to your staff and to your team for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. I'll share your song. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, rookie mistake. Uh, my apologies there. I did want to check with you in terms of your time. I do note that there is a, a question, essentially in, uh, a bit of a question in the chat. Um, and if you have a bit of time, uh, I'll, I'll turn to that. I just want to be respectful of your time. And, and the question is basically that uh, while there are you know good commitments from uh, your party and all the other parties, economic development often gets uh, a little less attention. And so the question is really about um, supporting First Nations being meaning involved through ownership of major projects uh, and or, you know, other business incentives. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. And yeah, we have a couple of minutes for, for questions. Uh, so um, I just wanted to, yeah, uh, thank you for the question. So uh, in terms of economic development, one of the things that we found is that without a nation to nation approach, what happens is it is a detriment not only to any projects moving forward, but it's also it's, it's a detriment not only to the indigenous community, but, but to all of Canada. And when projects that could be invested in that help us fight the climate crisis and reduce emissions, or great economic projects that could help spur economic activity that, that are within the framework, uh, when they are not being invested in, or when they're not moving forward because a lack of respect. This is economic development that, that is missed out by both indigenous communities, but everybody else probably. So there is a, a common interest 
for everyone's benefit to respect indigenous community rights so that God just can move forward in a great way and that everyone Thank you. There was a little bit of a stutter there on my end uh, at the very end, but uh, thank you very much for that. I am not seeing any other uh, hands raised from our chiefs of proxies in our um, in our chat. Uh, Cookby Robbins, perhaps we'll turn to you, and uh, that may be the last opportunity. Cookby, Cookby Robbins from Esketum in the Caribou uh, Chilcotin region. Uh, thank you, Harold. Uh, you take care. Uh, first of all, my, my question is is around the economic development piece that you just talked about. A lot of First Nations communities, especially in smaller areas in the rural and uh, in those rural communities, uh, what what kind of what can you foresee uh, if elected? What would you foresee doing for those smaller communities, so that are being left behind by uh, big business and uh, being run roughshod by big business? Uh, having their title and their rights uh, ignored by big business. Uh, what are what is it that you're willing to do to support them? Thank you, Chief, for the question. Uh, we absolutely support Indigenous communities and feel like the super rich, the big corporations, uh, large and wealthy, cultural elite have been given uh, free reign, and it's meant that Indigenous communities and other communities have suffered because of it. So uh, our approach would be. People first, First Nations, Indigenous communities, Inuit and Métis, uh, people, workers should benefit first from any any sort of agreements. And, and that approach is not the one we've seen. We've seen a lot of governments kind of uh, prioritize the big lobbyists of these large corporations and to the detriment of Indigenous communities. That's, that's something that I want to I wanna change. Thank you, sir. I would note that uh, Chief Charlene Gale uh, from Fort Nelson First Nations has raised her hand, and it was her question that uh, led off on the economic development of major projects uh, in the chat. Over to you, Chief Gale. Yeah, nice to nice to be able to talk to you. Um, so, as an Indigenous person, and uh, you know, we're working towards economic development to really um, offset our own source revenue. And so what I'm seeing in Canada is that there's a lot of projects that are important to us as Indigenous people that meet our values and meet our um, meet uh, who we are. But my question to you is um, what I'm also seeing is that a lot of these projects are delayed and there's extra cost because our Indigenous values aren't incorporated in them and we're not being invited to have equity in these projects. Um, First Nations on reserve are having a hard time getting um, money to be able to finance these projects, which is kind of leaving us behind. So what are your thoughts on federal loan guarantees for Indigenous communities? It can be a powerful tool to support it. Uh, I think what we need to do is unlock the capacity. There are so many things that Indigenous communities have uh, knowledge on, uh, have expertise on, and projects that are ready to go. And much like what we've seen over the past years, instead of a, an Ottawa knows best approach, instead of a, a dictating from top from down, indigenous communities can benefit from an approach which is based on collaboration, which is based on support. And a part of that is the economic and financial support. And so uh, loan, loan guarantees can be one tool to help us towards more economic development and activity that benefits Indigenous people instead of the very wealthiest. Okay, I'd just like to hear a little bit more of that on the campaign trail. I haven't heard anything from your party and, and several other parties. So, um, you know, I'm available if you would like to talk about my thoughts and my opinions on how that could be incorporated in your campaign trail. And if you're interested, I'll make myself available. So thank you. And and I just wanted to say that, um, that uh, yeah, I just I really appreciate, you know, you coming forward. And um, one of the uh, one of our band members said that your name kind of rhymes with uh, dry meat. So I, I think that's funny. And I just had to share that with you as Indigenous people. When we like people, we we make fun of each other. And uh, so just good luck on your campaign trail and uh, wishing you success. So thank you for being here today. 
Thank you so much, Sheikh, and, and it's, a, it's a good point. There's so many things I wish we could raise more, but, I, but I, I'll try to figure out ways that we can raise it. And, and we live the same tradition in, in uh, my, my mother's language, where when you like somebody and you're friends with them, you, you kind of like talk a little bit of fun. So I appreciate the love. Thank you so much. And uh, please count on me as an ally. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, and perhaps um, one last one, if you do have time, uh, sir. Uh, there's sure, a couple of questions one. relating to the f the fiscal framework, so the fiscal relationship between First Nations and the federal government, particularly around reporting burden seems to be one of the issues. Uh, some concerns there in terms of Indigenous employees and Indigenous knowledge not necessarily being uh, compensated at, at equal value. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that fiscal relationship a little bit. I think this uh, speaks to the underlying, you know, something that my friend So Momoka says, he's a member of Richard Parliament in Ontario, and he says, a lot of these systems people say are broken or aren't working, and he always comes back to the idea that, no, they're actually working exactly the way they're intended. They're intended to colonize, they're intended to uh, make Indigenous people feel inferior, be inferior, and uh, that's their outcomes, that's what they're doing. So a part of putting extra burden on indigenous communities that without the resources to, to be able to handle those burdens in terms of reporting obligations or uh, making sure or, or not having um, not having the fair compensation, equal compensation for for the same work, which are, or, or not acknowledging the expertise that flows from indigenous learnings. Uh, these are all symptoms of a broader problem of the systemic discrimination that exists in Canada that that does not treat indigenous people as equal, and and that's why we're, I'm noticing a bad connection. I hope it's I hope it's been fixed. But yeah, just I think it's a symptom of a broader problem, and why we we are committed to overhauling the system, and and why we think strongly that a lot of these problems can be fixed by uh, political will. It's it's been really a lack of. It's not that the answers aren't there. The solutions are there it's really the will hasn't been there i am committed to getting this right uh, making sure indigenous people have justice and you can count on me for that okay thank you and perhaps uh, just uh, uh, we are awaiting the indication from our electoral officer on the results of an online election that's happening as we uh, speak which is just wrapping up so i'm just i'm trying to take as much of your time as i can uh, until he tells me that i uh, we must turn to that attention. Uh, I did note that uh, Chief uh, Hobart has put some comments in the uh, chat, and I just wanted to call on Chief James Hobart from Spuzzum First Nation if he wishes to address the leader. Well, thank you, and uh, good afternoon, sir, and good luck in in your uh, in the campaign and in, uh, in the election. Uh, Chief sure. James Hobart from Spuzzum First Nation from the Ankle Cup Nation. But I've seen a, um, there's a gross oversight in Indigenous knowledge when it comes to the ministers, uh, uh, the different ministries, education, children and families, MSDPR, giving value to uh, Indigenous knowledge where we've been on the land, we've been in, our, in, the, in the nations with the, the different trials and tribulations that uh, are out there that you're speaking of. And unless you've lived it, it's pretty hard to understand it and we see in uh, the different ministries with uh, with the different uh, applications the job applications where one of our people that has uh, any of our people that have gone through the struggles to pull themselves up and to be there and help our people uh, go further being um, marginalized and as well uh, minimalized in uh, in the pay grade in order for them to move forward they have to get some other documentation when the reality is that the, you can't teach the indigenous knowledge that uh, a lot of these people have and yet there's no value to it when it comes to the mainstream it's overlooked and um, it's really uh, disturbing it's, it's troubling to see that happen especially when uh, there's people that are out there speaking on in behalf of the nations and the they hire indigenous people in the different ministries and it feels like they're not there to be draw uh, drawn upon for their information or their knowledge they're just being there to be tokenized or to be numbered and i really feel like that has to be addressed 
you know, we have to have some sort of, uh, not just equality, There, how many Indigenous people really stand up, I mean, to try to make a difference and then to only to be found that uh, that difference that has to come with a certain um, colonialized piece of paper that has to represent a, a certain level of other education before they can speak for their own nation, for their own uh, people and for some of the struggles that our people are going through. Unless you've been there on the reserves and in some of these homes and, uh, you know, there's a lot of good things. There's a lot of happy times. There's a lot of um, and joy that is, is being missed out on as well by people not observing uh, more closely uh, some of the beautiful things that are happening in our communities. But some of the struggles, you can't speak on them unless you've been around them. And we see people trying to speak on behalf of our children and our, our families and the education level and the children and families level. And it's really frustrating to see that. Anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, just hopefully that something can be be done about that. Cook's channel. Thank you very much. Back to you, um, um, Mr. Singh, and uh, perhaps uh, in response and as well as your closing comments. Sure, certainly. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chief, for the question. Uh, and, and it touches on the previous question as well, just the disproportionate pay, not acknowledging Indigenous skills and expertise and knowledge and uh, a different way of recognizing that talent. If it does not have a form of this paper, it's not recognized. I hear you on that. I see you on that. And I want to make sure you know that uh, the Democrats will continue to work to make sure that Indigenous communities get equity, not just equality, but equity it means more than just being treated equally, but uh, remedying the injustice by going beyond that. And, and I want you to know we'll, we'll be there for you. Uh, in closing, I just want to say it's an honor to be able to share some words with you. Sorry for the bumpy ride. I'm on the bus. I'm literally on the campaign trail. So uh, I'm driving along on the bus here. You saw the ring light in the background. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that we were able to be here today. So thank you for your patience. It's an honor to be here. Uh, thank you to all the chiefs. Thank you to the grand chief. Thank you to all the staff and to the team. And, and I'll put it to you again. We're, we're, we've been here for you. We'll fight for you. And we will continue to do that. And uh, I look forward to election day where we can inspire more people that we can we can, we can can ring in better, better as possible. And that we can have a world where we lift up indigenous people with respect to dignity and human rights. And that's exactly what, I, what I'll do as leader and what my team will do. Thanks so much. Appreciate you all. Thank you very much, sir. I do want to uh, note that this is, uh, we appreciate uh, being on the bus. It's the first time being on a campaign bus for many of us. And so that's a, a unique experience. And um, okay. I can. I just want to extend the, you know, really reiterate what you've heard, the appreciation, the respect, and the well wishes of the chiefs uh, uh, that you've heard uh, during this call. And I uh, wish you well and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, sir. Thanks again to all the Chiefs, yeah. Grand Chief. Thank you. All right. Then. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I am pleased to let you know that the Chief Electoral Officer has let me know that the results are available and we will turn to him.